you are watching news clip this is mapping fault lines uh, on tuesday us president joe biden and russian president vladimir putin had a two hour long call to discuss the escalating tensions on the border between russia and ukraine in the in the donbas region and uh, last week on the show we had talked about the historic reasons behind these escalating tensions and today we look at the call and the impact it could have on the future of the region we are joined by prabir kayasa so prabir can you tell us about this call you know russia uh, has been saying that it will uh, protect the donbas region if us sends in nato troops and us has not yet made any promises that it will not expand into the region so this is the impasse that the two countries were at this does, did this phone call change anything you know was there any deescalation from this point you know a summit discussion the way we have been used to seeing it means there is preparatory discussions that take place preparations which leads to a near understanding leaving only a few issues out and then it is thrashed out during the summit that means the preliminary groundwork is done before a summit meeting is called now we are having summit meetings whose purpose seems to be had to have a summit meeting so we don't understand whether there was any preparation was it grandstanding or was it responding to putin's statements that there are some red lines that russia has with regard to expansion of nato particularly putting nato batteries missile batteries or nuclear weapons close to its borders particularly in ukraine and why is it particularly in ukraine because ukraine has a history behind it part of the fact it is a part of soviet union one third of uh, the speaker the people who declare russian as their as their number one language I'm not going to call it the mother tongue are the, the one third of the population of ukraine speaks russian as their first language so there is a russian stake over there and it's also true over the last decade or so we have seen slow erosion of the right of the russian speakers in ukraine something which nato who otherwise claims to be the defender of democracy we know how shallow that is but nevertheless the when they talk about it they don't talk about the fact that russian radio stations have been stopped russian uh, newspapers and these are all ukraine uh, speakers speakers of russian they're not russian russian in the sense that all of this has taken place and there is a clear ri rise of what would be called anywhere else right wing forces owing allegiance to essentially the uh, the nazi sympathizers or supporters or collaborators if we will of ukraine during the second world war all those are being now brought to the forefront and the militias are very much a part of the ukrainian forces and very much in the front line of all these attacks as well as post to also perhaps enter donbas region if fighting break breaks out there again so russia's response to all of this has been twofold one is to say if what the minsk accord had said that autonomy and uh, discussions with the government in ukraine zelensky government uh, as as it is now uh, does not take place then it's a violation of the minsk agreement now this is something that the europeans have refused to respond to and the nato has been only talking about Uh, russian intervention in ukraine not willing to say that will the ukrainian government central government send its troops again to donbas and that was the fight the, the war that took place over there which led finally to a, the minsk accord where a peace was a, reached with the understanding the two parties the donbas region and the ukrainian central government would discuss the issue of a lasting autonomy now that not having happened are we going to see an, again a uh, the civil war break out and this time it's the ukrainian forces like last time entering the donbas region and trying to exercise central authority over the region now this is a red line for russia which it is said in so many words but the other part which they have raised is the nato expansion and the fact that nato expansion while it was said 
that it will not expand beyond the German borders. This was the uh, undertaking they had given to uh, Gorbachev. That has not only not been kept, it has moved, as somebody has pointed out, 600 miles uh, east of that border. So given that Russia has now said, we have a red line. We don't want any more NATO missile batteries on our borders. And if this happens, then it is an existential issue for Russia. But more important than that, I think is the issue, will the NATO forces, will the United States back the gov central government in Ukraine to intervene militarily on Donbass? And if they do, then of course, Russia will protect Donbass. That's what it has been saying. So the ball is really not on Russia's court. It is really on the court of the NATO powers. And the fact that they're not willing to go to what to go the course that themselves had agreed to in Minsk. I think that is the key issue on the issue on this Donbass uh, region and the tension that is building thereof. And we don't see that we have resolved anything over there except the fact that now Biden, for the first time, has said they are going to set up a mechanism with Russia to discuss the expansion of NATO and Russia's, whatever Russia's reservations might be. And the fact that they're going to discuss it also seems to be uh, causing some repercussions, some uh, misgivings, some fear in the other NATO partners who in the expansion that NATO has had are also on the borders of Russia. And I think that's something that we now have to see what would be their reaction and what is the, you know, the US reaction to that going to be. So probably the next question then would be that, that you know, what has been the response of the other countries who have joined NATO, uh, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union, what has their response been to, to these discussions that are going on? I think the fact that Russia has now started laying down some red lines means that these countries are worried that is it possible that Russia might say that you remove the missile batteries, you don't put NATO, NATO troops uh, on the borders. Is, are those things possible? You know, when the NATO expansion took place, Norway and a couple of other countries in NATO had suggested that, you know, we don't really have to position troops, batteries, and so on. We can give an undertaking that we'll not put nuclear weapons in these countries. You will not put missile batteries in these countries, even if they join the NATO. That is what, at that point of time, the United States was not willing to agree to. And they, in fact, you know, the opposition of some of these countries, Norway being one of them, they said, no, no, we'll go full ahead and do what we want over there. And that's what, what has led to what today Putin calls as a threat to Russia, that NATO batteries are really on the borders of Russia and can hit Russia within about five, seven minutes. And meaning not Russia only, but the command centers in Russia, which is what is the worrying part in a nuclear exchange. So given that, though they have been very late at laying down the red line, which they have done over Ukraine now. The real issue is that is going to continue to be a contentious uh, point. And if, for instance, uh, Biden is willing to negotiate with Russia about NATO, then it does mean that some of these issues which have not been under discussion, the US has refused to accept that, that these are countries, these are issues with which we can negotiate with Russia. They have said, this is free for us. It, you have nothing to do with it. It's their sovereign right. It's our sovereign right to do what we want. Theoretically, that's true. But it's never been true that if you put missile batteries on my borders, that I have no, no say in it is correct. But it does also mean that I can threaten you similarly. So, you know, these kind of issues are not a simple matters of uh, rules and law. They're also matters of geostrategic importance. So given this, I think for the first time, uh, the United States has recognized at least to need to talk to Russia on this. Will it lead to any change in the Baltic regions and other countries like Romania, Poland, who host NATO batteries? We will have to see. I don't think those countries has as much, as much leverage as, for instance, Russia has with respect to 
the Baltic, other Balt smaller Baltic countries. So we'll have to see what happens over there. But it's quite possible that Putin accepts what is already a fait accompli, that the batteries are there, but puts his foot down on the issue of Ukraine. And that's also because if they want to put nuclear missiles in Ukraine, Ukraine may also have a finger on the trigger. And that's something that Russia would not really accept. So I think this uh, talk about the Baltic countries getting uh, really scared or spooked, though I think those are really minor uh, issue. The real issue is Ukraine. And Ukraine is clearly coming to be something which will lead to the NATO either accepting that Russia has a stake in Ukraine or telling Russia, we don't have, we don't accept whatever you are saying. We will integrate it into NATO. We'll use NATO forces if necessary to conquer Donbass and we'll put missile batteries. And if you don't agree with this, if you don't accept this, then we'll use what has been called the nuclear economic sanction, which is throw you out of the SWIFT system, which means it's really a declaration of economic war. So, you know, things are very, very, uh, poised at a very critical, in a very critical way. And I think the real issue will be, what is the European Union going to do? Because if the sanctions are extended to Russia, the way the Americans have threatened, effectively, this is the threat the game that will throw you out of the economic system. Very severe sang economic sanctions, they called it. It means that there will be Nord Stream gas, which is supposed to be what is reaching Europe, Western Europe, also the gas which goes to Ukraine and Poland to Western Europe, all of that will stop because they will not be able to pay for it. Of course, this is good for the United States. They're fracking uh, gas, which can then be exported to Europe. But the point is, it's a disaster for Western Europe as well. So what are the European nations going to do is something that we have to watch. And unfortunately, Germany, which is having a change in government at the moment, there the people who have come into power seem to believe that a fight with Russia is not too bad for us. Now, why they think so, I have no idea. But it does seem to, uh, we do seem to see statements which are quite aggressive and which is not what Germany did under Angela Merkel. So we'll also have to see the new government in Germany, how they behave. And in Europe, let's face it, Germany is the major player, followed by France. So these two countries are really going to decide how the European Union will respond to this. At the moment, the position is not clear what the European Union and the European powers in NATO are going to do. And I think a lot of that would also depend on what approach they take to the issue of Ukraine. Thank you for talking to us today, Prabhi. That's all the time we have. Keep watching your stuff.